everyone, and again, it is great to see you here. I'm going to invite you, if you have a Bible or device, to turn to the Song of Songs, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and uh, in the Bible provided for you, it's page 547. If you're a guest with us, again, welcome to Woodside, and for those watching online, we're glad you joined with us. Today we are starting a three-week series in the book uh, Song of Songs entitled A Love Story. This book is about a love story. Uh, it's a song, if you will. It's, it's about a romance between a young man and a young woman that is set to music that describes their betrothal uh, we would say dating and engagement. Uh, betrothal is maybe a bit more formal. It describes their dating and engagement, their wedding, and their marriage. And uh, if you've tried to read this book before, um, there's a gr good possibility it's one of the places in the Bible that you scratch your head and you're like, what is going on? Uh, especially if you're not a poet. I'm not a poet. And this book has been a, a struggle at times. And uh, so we want to just right up front say, we don't read the book Song of Songs like we would read Romans. We read it like a song. This is a love song. And uh, again, it's poetry set to music. And you'll find today, as you look on, uh, listen to Spotify or whoever you listen to, whatever you listen to, a lot of the love songs are poetry set to music. And uh, so why are we doing this series? A couple reasons. First is it gives us a vision for marriage, for the whole dating engagement and wedding and marriage. It, it's inspiring. This is what God uh, sees and wants for marriages. And uh, I'm going to typically, I have this habit when we're talking about marriage to look over at the young people and uh, say, okay, man, take some notes. Uh, but maybe I'm excluding somebody. Uh, just outside of Kansas City, uh, there is a couple, uh, 96 years old. And uh, they played in a senior's residence pool every single morning except Sunday. And they were both Christians. And eventually he got to know her and popped the question. She said no. And then a second time around, she said yes. And then it killed me what he said. He said, uh, and he's married now to her at 96. He said, um, I plan to, oh, he said, marriage is a sacred obligation. And I plan to spend the rest of my life fulfilling what I said I would do. <laughs> and I'm thinking, pal, you're 96 the rest of your life. So if you're older, uh, I'm not excluding you. It gives us a vision of marriage. But there's something else. It's not just a love song. This love song points us to an eternal love song. This love story points us to a bigger love story. This Song of Songs is for all of us. So if you are looking to get married, uh, if you're single by choice, you're single by providence, uh, if you are divorced, if you are a widow, if you are a widower, if you're married, this song is for everyone because it speaks of our relationship with God. When you look through your Bible, you will find a lot of marital imagery where God commun communicates to us and he says, you know this husband-wife relationship? It's a picture of my relationship with my people. That Jesus says every book of the Bible in John chapter 5 and Luke 24 is about him. So this song ultimately is about Jesus. And then Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, the husband-wife thing, it's, it's, it's representative of the God and us thing. It's a profound mystery. So this series, I just want to say all that is for all of us because there's a bigger song, a bigger story going on. So... Uh, we can look at it. For those of you that are note takers, um, this song's divided into eight chapters in three parts, or if you will, three verses. Uh, the first is engagement, and that's the first part of the song, and then the wedding, second part of the song, and then marriage, the third part of the song. And we're going to find three singers singing 
Uh, there is the Shulamite woman. She's from the village of uh, Shulam, which in uh, today, if you were to go to Israel, it's in northern Israel. It used to be known as the Valley of Jezreel. Today, it's known as the Valley of Armageddon. And so she's out in the countryside in the north uh, of Israel. And just to note, she does 65% of the talking. I'm just observing, no comments. <laughs> the second singer is, uh, we believe, King Solomon, and he is in Jerusalem. And the third singer, it's actually a group of singers, are the backup singers known as the Daughters of Jerusalem. So they're going to do, you know, you're the one that I want, ooh, ooh, ooh. They're the ones doing the ooh, ooh. <laughs> From time to time, they will add their two cents. So let's begin with the introduction, really, to the song. We read in verse 1, Solomon's Song of Songs. So this is the, this is the greatest song. We think of Holy of Holies, uh, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. This is the Song of Songs. This is the most important song. And we know from uh, 1 Kings chapter 4 that Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs. This king that lived almost 3,000 years ago wrote 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 songs. And this is the one song, his top song. And uh, 900 years B.C., you would have seen this on the charts at number one for a long time. Weddings, they would have sang part of this song. And uh, just one note, I'm going to take the traditional view that Solomon wrote this um, song. And uh, the question is, though, wait a second. I think Solomon had more than one wife. Um, and we would believe that he wrote this song later in life describing his first love, his true love, uh, before things started to go sideways, got into politics and all of that. Um, so he's writing back reflecting. So that's the one view, the traditional view, uh, and that's what we're, we're going to work from. But there's another view too. This uh, Solomon's Song of Songs really reads Song of Songs, which are Solomon's, which can lead to the idea that someone else wrote it and dedicated it to Solomon. That, that view holds merit as well. We're going to look at it as a young man and a young woman, and this is their song. So let's begin in verse chapter 2. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. So we find a young woman, she's intoxicated by love. First, she's talking about being attracted to him and wanting to kiss him. And by the way, those are good things, okay? That being attracted to someone and, and, and desiring to kiss is, is a good thing. And uh, we sometimes feel that with hormones and pheromones, uh, these triggers in the brain. Uh, she also talks, he, uh, his fragrance uh, is pleasing. Man, she likes the way that he smells. Okay, you ever seen the Axe commercial on TV? The guy walks back, there, there's, there. likes the way. In that day, smell was a big thing because they didn't shower every day, and so they have to wear bombs, and it's, it was a big thing. <laughs> but more than a physical attraction and a good smell, there was something that she held more attractive, and that was his character. Notice the word, the phrase, your name. Uh, we don't really think much of that, but in that day, in Hebrew culture, in ancient Israel, your name was your character. So she is praising his character. Your name is better than wine being poured, or perfume being poured out. So she's attracted to his character. So just a few notes for those of you that might be thinking of getting married. Uh, physical attraction is a good thing. And uh, and just want to say, too, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So you may not feel you're beautiful, but it's in the eye of the beholder. And God can work um, in your situation. So um, attraction is a good thing, but character matters more. You see, your physical attraction in time, uh, the way you look, uh, that beauty, it's going to fade. Um, heads up to all you young ladies. There may be a day that the guy that, if God should so lead, the guy that you married might not have as much hair as he has right now. 
Uh, he, his muscles might not be as strong. His waistline or six-pack abs may not be six-pack abs later on. Okay. And guys, the girl, if God should lead that you might marry, she might have a few wrinkles in time. So beauty, it fades. It also can deceive. In the book of Proverbs, we're reminded again and again, oh, here's this beautiful woman on the outside, but on the inside, and it's like, oh, she's like this. Okay, so character trumps um, physical attraction. And so that's why we have Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3 saying uh, to the wise and to young women, hey, your fancy hair and your clothes, that's not should be the focus of your beauty. Your focus of the beauty should be on your inner self. That's your true beauty. That lasts. And guys, you want to find a girl that has true beauty. And uh, girls, you want to find a guy that is beautiful on the inside. And when you have Jesus working in a young man's life and a young woman's life, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self and self-control. And I will add, even though I didn't write the Bible, I will say, and a sense of humor as well. Um, Jesus had a sense of humor. But when Jesus is working in two lives, man, he's kind. She's kind. He's faithful. She's faithful. And so young people are, if you're a little older and you're looking, um, physical attraction is great, but man, you want someone with character. And just a note too, character takes time to assess. Sometimes when you first start dating, you can put your best foot forward, right? You're just like, and you're not going to show them who you really are. And uh, anybody uh, can fake it for a while. So you need time to assess, what's he like? Does he really love the Lord? Does he really, uh, what, what, what's, you know, what's going on with him or with her? It takes time to access character. So let's continue the song. She's intoxicated by his love. Verse 4, take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. She is dreaming of marrying this guy and the wedding night, him carrying her across the threshold into the bedroom. So that, man, she's dreaming about him. And then we have the friends, the backup singers, and they sing, we rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. And she responds, how right they are to adore you. So she has the daughters of Jerusalem, her friends, who are looking at this relationship, and we're all behind it. We're all behind it. Again, especially young people, don't dismiss godly counsel. If you have a friend, you have parents, and they love you, you're listening to what they say about the person you're dating. You're listening to what they see about the person you're dating. Because uh, sometimes we can look when those hormones and pheromones are kicking in, we can look through rose-colored glasses, and we miss a whole lot going on. We're not maybe as rational as we usually are, but, but people can speak into into uh, the other person. And again, it's your final decision, but godly counsel, uh, that there is safety in, in the multitude of counselors. So she's attracted to him, she wants to be kissed by him, but she's concerned about something. It wouldn't be a Hallmark movie if there wasn't a bit of tension somewhere, right? Okay, <laughs> verse five. Dark am I, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I had to neglect. So she's dark. Now, she's not speaking of race. She's speaking of the sun, that the sun has weathered her. Now, this woman, as you read through this song, um, she's comfortable in her own skin. She's an independent woman. But yet, this about her complexion bothers her, that she's had to work outside in the sun and labor in the sun. Why? Because she had brothers, and she refers to them as her mother's sons, which kind of leads us to believe they were half-brothers, and they were mean to her and made her work. Almost 3,000 years before Walt Disney World and Cinderella, this was like the original Cinderella, okay? These half-brothers made her work. And she says, 
I didn't take care of my vineyard. So I've been working out in the hot blazing sun out in the countryside in northern Israel and my complexion, I've had no time to take care of myself. I'm dark, like she mentions, the, the tents, tents of Qadar. Uh, those are tents that, that were found in Saudi Arabia at that time, and still today, Bedouins use them. They're, they're tents made from the, skin, uh, from the hair of, of, of goats, so it's dark hair. And she's like, I'm like that in Solomon's curtains. So she doesn't feel very pretty, and she feels insecure. I want to pause for just a moment. Today, that's a similar struggle for many women, and for some men as well, but this struggle about how they look. We get that um, uh, by just our, the standard that is often put out in our uh, society, that you're beautiful if you look like this. And again, as followers of Jesus, we're looking at men and women and true beauty. Uh, but when you have this standard out there and that's where your focus is, it can lead to these feelings of insecurity. I'm ugly. Nobody would ever want me. And I just want to say to you parents, there have been a number of studies that show the more that your young daughter looks at these images on social media, in movies, on music video, the more they will feel insecure about how they look, the more dissatisfied they will feel about how they look. So mom and dad, you need to put boundaries on what they are watching. And you want to affirm, and we need the church, Woodside as well, to affirm true beauty. Yes, you want to do the best you can to take care of yourself, but we're focused on true beauty beauty. Loves this guy. Her friends are behind her. She feels insecure about herself. We continue in the song, verse 7. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday, why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? Okay, didn't have text, didn't have email, didn't have landline phones. She's like, where is he? I want to be with him. Notice, though, she wants to be with him at midday. In ancient Israel, uh, in the evenings, the veiled woman, uh, as a reference to prostitute, there were certain women, uh, women of the night at, in, in that day as well. And she says, I don't want this relationship in the darkness. I want it at midday. In other words, I really like this guy, and I want to be with him, but I'm not just going to give myself to him. I have boundaries. I want to meet him at midday. Then her friends chime in again, verse 8. And next uh, verse, if you, if you do not know, most beautiful women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. He's there. And now we hear Solomon sing. Verse 9, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. <laughs> your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. Okay, to all of you young guys wanting to, or you like a girl, okay, I'd be careful about using this line. Okay. <laughs> You really don't want to compare the girl you like to a horse. Okay, <laughs> not going to go well. In that day, though, in that day, it was a good thing to say. What he's saying here is that Pharaoh had these chariot horses. That he had stallions, all of these stallions, these male horses, and there she was, the mare. What he's saying to her is, you are the only woman in the world for me. You're the one. Okay? Good line. <laughs> A little later in the song, he's like, oh, you're this. And then she comes back, verse 14. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of En Gedi. Again, if you're reading this, you're like, what's with all this poetry? Like, just say it like it is, man. Okay, uh, but she says, she says, 
And if you've been to En Gedi in northern in, in Israel, uh, it's just desert, and then you come to this place, and there's an oasis water with, with some flowers. And she's saying, like, all the men in the world are like a desert, but you're my oasis. Another good line. It continues, verse 15. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. So he reminds her, or he says, you know, you remind me of a horse, and you look like a bird. <laughs> Again, guys, yeah. What he's saying there is the dove has a singular focus, and he's like, oh, you're my darling, and you have eyes for me alone. And she, back at him, how handsome you are, my beloved. Now, what is interesting here, in this song, she tells, he tells her 14 times how beautiful she is, affirming her, and she tells him once how handsome he is. Just another observation. Okay. <laughs> she goes on to say, how handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming, and our bed is verdant. And then he responds, the beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are firs. So we would think, oh, the bed, are, are they talking about the bed? They're talking, again, this is poetry, this is a metaphor. Our bed is verdant, meaning our, our, our bed is green. And so they're out in a green grassy field, and he responds, and oh, the trees above us, they're like our home. They're like our cathedral. So here they are out uh, on the countryside having a picnic together somewhere in northern Israel, and uh, again, just love sick for each other, okay? Anybody know what we're talking about here, okay? She goes on in the song. She sings in verse 1 of chapter 2, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. And again, she likes the guy, uh, but she says, I'm a rose of Sharon or a lily of the valley. I mean, there's 100,000 lilies of the valley. I'm just a plain girl. I'm just a plain, common girl. She's not fishing for a compliment, but rather, you know, she's been weathered, and she just has a hard time believing that she's beautiful. And he responds, verse 2, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young women. Okay, so there are 100,000 lilies, but all of them, to me, they're thorns. You are the one. You're the flower. He affirms her. Guys, that's a good line, too. You're a lily among thorns. Or we would say a rose among thorns. She then continues as we go to in verse 4. Let him lead me to the banquet hall and let his banner over me be love. Okay, they're out in this picnic under the sky and uh, in the north of Israel. And the banquet hall's in Jerusalem. She's liking that her relationship is progressing it's going public. She's bringing, he's bringing her home to meet mom and dad, to meet his friends. And then she says, let his banner over me be love in that day, a banner. You would have a banner uh, that would identify you with this tribe or with this family. And uh, let this banner over me be love. In other words, oh, that he would be belong to me and I would belong to him. He'd be committed to me and I'd be committed to him. Let his banner over me be love. And then she says this, she sings this. And this is where we're going to stop just for a few moments. She says, daughters of Jerusalem. So she's speaking to her friends, her young female friends. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Now, what's going on with the gazelles and the does? Now, we lose some of this with our English translation, but in the Hebrew, the word for gazelle and doe, they rhyme, those two words rhyme with two names of God. So in that day, she was saying, let God be our witness, as, with God as our witness. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. She's saying love has its time and its place. Don't stimulate love prematurely. Don't rush into things. Don't give yourself away prematurely. And she's thinking about their physical relationship. She's attracted to him. He's attracted to her. But no, young women 
And in ancient Israel, among the Jews, you waited to have sex until you were married. Now, don't, and nobody check out here. Hang with me. Want to realize that the sexual impulse, okay, that can happen is God-given, and because it's God-given, it's to be God-guided or God-governed, okay? We're listening to a script from people with God not in the equation, and those people didn't create sex. They didn't invent it. They didn't create anatomy. God did. And God says, here's this gift, and here's the context for it to be used. And I want to say, too, just pause again here. Christianity is not about rules and relationships. It's like, oh, here we go. The church is judging. Do this. Don't do this. They don't want me to do this. No. Christianity is about a relationship with the God that made you in Jesus Christ. And when you give your life to Jesus, you surrender your whole life to him, which includes your sexuality. So at Woodside, sex is not what we talk about all the time. When Scripture talks about it, we'll talk about it. But we believe that God's ways are best. And so with that in mind, we will say, hey, sex is a gift. It has a place, a right place for it. For those young people, just want to uh, remind you that the script that this society gives you, it leads nowhere. I've referenced the book uh, by Donna Friedis, who uh, wrote the book, How Hookup Culture is Leaving a Generation Unhappy. And then a more recent book, Christine Emba's book, she's a, a columnist for the Washington Post, not a Christian, I don't think, and her book is called Rethinking Sex. And in her book, she talks about looking at the evidence, research, she talks about how today we are hearing about sex, that it's open, it's free, be liberated, you'll find happiness and satisfaction. And she says, that's all wrong. It only leads to isolation and loneliness, regret and resentment. So the women on college or university campuses and the hookup culture, women, you're being lied to. Guys, you are being lied to. With this conversation, yeah, I, I just want to mention too, is we didn't just get here um, overnight. If you look at Freud, if you look at Kinsey, if you look at Masters and Johnson, sex is reduced to a physical experience devoid of any other meaning. And that is so wrong. It's so much more than the physical. And so that's why the, 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 the surveys are showing that it hasn't led to happiness and satisfaction because there's no intimacy. There's a context for intimacy. And uh, I'm just going to mention this to our young people and parents in particular. With this conversation around sexuality, I want to just mention a few names because there are some Christians out there who are speaking so well into this issue of sexuality. Sam Alberry, who experiences same-sex attraction, and because of his relationship with Jesus, has chosen to be celibate. If you read anything of his, any of his books, or hear any of his, uh, he's on podcasts, he is a great guy, very insightful. Rebecca McLaughlin, who also happens to experience same-sex attraction, but is married to a guy, anything she writes is so good. Anything that she speaks. But the one I really want to focus on and, and mention today is Julie Slattery. She's a clinical uh, psychologist, uh, Julie Slattery, and she's written a number of books, God, Sex, and Your Marriage, Rethinking Sexuality, Sex and the Single Girl, Surprised by the Healer. If you've experienced sexual abuse or betrayal in marriage, I'd encourage you to get that book, Surprised by the Healer. She also has a weekly podcast uh, called Java with Julie, where she talks to parents and she says the sexual, um, the, the sex conversation can't be just a one-off. It has to be sexual discipleship. She talks about uh, just if one of your children is, uh, identifies with LGBTQ, uh, um, and they're, what's, how, do we res how do we respond to that? If she talks about um, uh, husbands and wives and, and marital intimacy as well. So Julie Slattery was a name I'd highly encourage you to check out. And all of that to say this, 
is that she says, this young Shulamite woman, oh, ladies, let's not just give ourselves away quickly. There's a right place and a right time. And I just want to say, too, if there's someone here and um, you are currently living with someone, and I know sometimes with children that brings other things into the equation, but I would want to encourage you to think about getting married. It's a good thing. Uh, if you're here and you're in a relationship, but there's uh, sexual boundaries that are crossed, I want to encourage you to step back, trust Jesus, because he always honors faith, and say, Lord, we want to do it your way, uh, and which mean, mean you have to set up some boundaries. Um, and um, yes, and I also want to say, if you're here, again, we're not here to judge at all. We're not here to shame. And God is a forgiving God, but His ways are best. He wants the best for you. So what is He saying to you today? And then if you're on the other hand and you've never had sex, don't let anyone shame you or pressure you into sex. Uh, it's a gift from God. It has a right place and a right time. Okay, verse 14. Is everybody still with me? Okay, here we go. He then sings this, My dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. What he's saying is, I want to know everything about you. I want to know what makes you tick. I want to make what makes you happy. And uh, young people, I will say, if you are dating, try to find out as much as you can about the person you're dating before marriage. I mean, in marriage, there's always going to be surprises, but you want to minimize those surprises. So you want to find out uh, as much as possible about each other. Now, the picture here that he gives, Solomon gives, he, he's talking about a dove uh, in the rocks, hiding in the rocks, and that's what they did uh, and do. And he's... The, the, the man is trying to woo the woman out. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to see your face. Okay? Have you ever wondered how, sometimes how young people, when they are in this stage, they can talk on the phone for like three hours? Two to three hours. Wooing her, I want to know you. And I just, a quick word to husbands. When we get married... The wooing is not to stop. That we need to keep wooing our wives. We need to be romantic. Now, what does romantic mean? Right? More than one guy has scratched his head like, I'm not a romantic type. What, what's this romance that she wants? Well, as best as I can say, this is just my own two cents, romance is making her feel special whether it's through your words, through your actions, that you're giving her time and attention. And it takes work to make her feel special. It takes time to woo. So even if you're not a poet, what can you say or what can you do on a regular basis to make her feel special? And, and wives, if your husband, okay, has not made you feel special in a long time and this week he tries to make you feel special, and he does something or says something, you're like, what a knucklehead. Okay, like just, <laughs> listen, he's trying. Help him. Please help him. He, he wants to, right? And the more that a couple can look at the true beauty of one another and those character qualities that drew them to each other, the more that spark will, be, will come back. So, so husbands, we don't stop wooing once we're married. And it does take work. Again, parents, with your kids, man, you're just everywhere, but they can't be the center of your home. You have to give each other or make time, uh, even if it's a small amount of time, on a regular basis for each other. Then he goes and says this in verse, sings this in verse 15. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, are vineyards that are in bloom. In the vineyards in northern Israel in particular, the little foxes could come in and ruin the vineyards. And notice that they're little foxes. They're not big foxes coming in. And he's saying, we, to the woman, we, I want to deal with anything in this relationship. I want to catch these little foxes because I don't want to ruin this relationship. And uh, we're going to talk more about this next week, but uh, one of the things, a little fox in marriage or even in a dating relationship is unresolved conflict. 
And what can happen is, is we can just see these little things and let them go and go and go and go. And next thing we're separated or divorced because we didn't deal with those little foxes. So in a dating relationship, in a marriage, we've got to catch these little foxes, which means we have to communicate. And if you're having a hard time communicating with your significant other, I'd encourage you to reach out here at Woodside. We would get help get you counseling or something, another party to help with that. And then she closes with this. And this is where we're going to close the song. This, or this is where we're going to end this part of the song. Verse 16, my beloved is mine and I am his. This is a guy wooing his girl. He loves her. This is a girl. She loves her guy. What a great relationship. I want to ask you, is that your refrain with Jesus? I am his, and he is mine. This love song speaks to an eternal love song. This love story speaks to an eternal love story. All of us, whether we're single, by choice, by providence, married, divorced, widow, widower, Okay, marriage is a temporary reality that points to an eternal truth. That all of us are born single, we die single, and the most important thing of your life is not any human relationship. It's with God. It's intimacy with God. You were made for Him. Can you say to God, you're the one that I want? I want to ask you, when was the last time you were lost in amazement thinking that he should love me. That he longs for my presence. Jesus woos you. That's why he left heaven to come to earth to die on a cross because he loves you more than anyone. He loved you so much. He said, I'm going to do what it takes to pay for this sin problem so that I could be with my beloved forever. If you're a Christian today, his banner over you is love. And on that banner is the emblem, emblem of a cross. And every day, you remind yourself of someone that loves you and is more committed to you than anybody else. And even if you've been married for 70 years and you have the best husband or best wife, there's someone that loves you more than that. And if you're here today and you've never, ever said yes to Jesus, today you can say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I admit them. And by faith, I'm believing you died on the cross for me to forgive me, and I want to receive you as my Savior, as my Lord, as my betrothed. Jesus, I want to spend all eternity with you, and I will say to you, all of you in this auditorium, all of you watching online, for every single one of us, there is hope because there's a God who loves us. I'm going to invite you to stand. <laughs> In just a few moments, we are going to witness and experience three people getting baptized who have said yes to Jesus, and we celebrate that. And I'd like to, just before that, I'd like to ask you where you are with Jesus. And maybe today, you need to ask him to stir your affections for him. He's the greatest thing in life. Don't miss this relationship with him. And maybe today, you want to come into that relationship with him. So I'm going to invite you to join with me as we pray. Father, thank you that at Woodside that we can wait in hope for the day when we see your son Jesus. Lord, help us to continue to sing. Help us con to continue to celebrate. And Lord, if there's someone here today that has never said yes to your son Jesus and entered into a relationship with him, give them the faith today help them to do that. And just where you are right now, I invite you with your heads bowed. What has God said to you 
today as we've opened his word. Would you respond to him? Would you talk to him?